Hello, uh, my name is Michael Kramer. I am uh, the Calibration uh, and Inspection Program Manager of Perry Johnson Laboratory Accreditation. And it's my pleasure to uh, present uh, the May monthly webinar, um, which as you can see is on, uh, on a center around our uh, PJLA's policy on proficiency testing, which is uh, PL1. Again, thanks. Thank you all for uh, logging in and being with us uh, today. So as always, uh, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, hence, you can go back and uh, re-listen to it uh, after uh, the conclusion of today's presentation. We also have available just the webinar slides. Uh, if you uh, would like to extract the slides from today's presentation, uh, we actually have a webinar tab at uh, uh, pjlabs.com. And feel free to uh, capture the slides from this uh, webinar or go back and listen to the recording. Or you can go back several years. You have a wealth of uh, material there. You can, you're free to uh, uh, re-listen uh, or uh, capture some slides if, uh, if you're interested. So before I get started, uh, one uh, thing I want to mention is uh, PJLA's update notification. So if you're accredited with us, uh, you would have recently received an update notification. And wow, we're up to update notification 55 now. And you can see we sent that out on, uh, released it on April the 2nd. So we recently have uh, gone through our uh, policies and made quite a few revisions. Uh, these revisions were made, uh, oh, for one thing, we had to, uh, um, come up to speed and uh, actually reference the 2017 standard uh, as opposed to the old clauses in 2005. And as you'll see, uh, our policies are also uh, uh, intertwined with ILAC policies. Uh, ILAC is the folks that the PJLA has the international recognition in and the uh, MRA, Mutual Recognition Agreement with. Um, they have policy documents. They've recently been revised as well. So today we're going to look at PL1. So we're going to hone in on the uh, update notification, uh, some of the uh, changes, uh, and uh, you'll we'll hit on them throughout the, the uh, presentation. Is we added a uh, clause in here for anyone who's involved in TNI, the DOD programs at the PJLA. Um, you can see and. Uh, we've uh, expanded on that. We've provided some clarification on the plan there as far as who can sign off and who needs to approve uh, oh, uh, um, deviations uh, and uh, from the plan as far as doing an intra-lab and repeatability. Uh, we've uh, clarified a definition of internet, excuse me, interlab comparison. And uh, we've uh, modified um, and we actually loosened up, uh, and I'll go into more detail when we get to that. If you uh, do an interlap comparison against a uh, versus uh, other organizations that are not accredited, uh, we sort of loosened um, criteria of those other labs up here. So again, as I uh, mentioned, uh, I want to mention two documents, of course, uh, ILAC P9, and then, of course, uh, 17025-2017. These requirements that are pertaining to proficiency testing, these feed into uh, PJLA's PL1. So these are not extra things we're, we're having you do uh, to maintain an accreditation with us. Uh, like I mentioned, ILAC, they're the folks that recognize us. They have policies, so we have to implement their policies. So uh, they have a document, P9, just for proficiency testing. And of course, uh, 17025, uh, um, they have requirements concerning the um, validity of uh, testing calibration results, um, section 7.7. 7. 
and some new requirements has been added to that that we've incorporated into our uh, PJLA's policy as well. So uh, PL1, and it's available on our website, by the way, uh, if you're interested under resources, uh, documents, our policies, uh, uh, PL1234, among others, are um, on our website. Um, and PL1 includes such things as uh, frequencies, acceptable means of comparing and analyzing data, competency requirements, and uh, international program requirements. So yes, you're required to do proficiency testing. Um, however, uh, on its uh, by itself, for proficiency tests will provide, and reasons also for a lot of weight being placed on proficiency testing by the accrediting body is proficiency testing will provide the objective evidence of an organization's capability to produce data that is both accurate and repeatable for the activities listed uh, within a scope of accreditation. Favorable proficiency testing data can be used to demonstrate an organization's competence to their clients, potential customers, your accrediting bodies, and perhaps other external entities. Proficiency, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, participation in proficiency testing can also provide your, your organization invaluable feedback as to your internal monitoring of an organization's quality systems. So ideally, uh, um, with calibration, you have a, uh, oh, you have traceability requirements. Um, you have um, hopefully an internal measurement assurance program uh, in place to assure that your measurements are, are being taken um, within a, uh, within a set predetermined control limits. For you folks out there in testing, you have uh, controlled samples, flight blank spikes, uh, those those types of things that are also incorporated into your uh, your um, testing results. So uh, the participation and feedback will provide invaluable feedback as to how perhaps uh, given give your organization a uh, hopefully a thumbs up that the, hey. We have all these internal controls. Everything appears to be working for us, and uh, successful proficiency testing can provide that objective evidence. So, prior to an accreditation, if you're an applicant, uh, and I highlighted must there, I refer to it as a slam dunk. You cannot get accredited until you have successfully completed proficiency testing within the requirements set down in PL1. So that's very important. If you're an applicant lab, uh, you should plan ahead uh, and um, get that initially initial proficiency testing under your belt. Uh, so I put there, do not pass go, do not collect 200 bucks. Uh, you're not gonna get in credit uh, until that has been completed. And then uh, once you got that initial one under your belt, and we'll talk about the four-year plan and and uh, frequencies here in a little bit, uh, you're going to be required to do proficiency tests annually. So annually, if you're a, if you're a one lab that has one item on your scope, that means you'll have to do that particular proficiency test annually. If you're one of these labs that has a 45, 50 page scope, well, we're going to get into that here in a little bit as to how that's going to be, be um, covered as far as the frequency. So uh, a four-year plan. So PJLA has it established, and this correlates to ILAC policies, that you have to have a proficiency testing plan in, in effect. Uh, we actually have a template. Again, it's available on our website under the Forms tab. It's one of our LF Forms, LF81, where you can document your four-year plan. We, are, we don't require you to use that. Uh, if you have a similar form that will accomplish the same um, objective as the L, LF81 and you want to use it, uh, by all means, you can do that. Um, and uh, once that plan is not a one-time one time thing, uh, organizations are responsible for updating the plan prior to expiration. And these are four-year plans. 
again, available on our website for those that might want to utilize the LF81. So here's one of the updates here um, um, that uh, we've added and may or may not apply to you, but these are for the uh, DND, Departments of Defense, EPA, uh, if you can see all the programs listed there. Um, and what's been added uh, is that uh, if you're performing testing or calibration under these programs, uh, whose proficiency testing are, are specific, and exceed the requirements of this document, being PL1, for other programs, uh, such as a, a plan, is met by maintaining participation in the program. If the laboratory in these programs also has other testing under 17025-2017, that's not part of these programs, then they'll need a separate plan in accordance with this document. For those other tests, unless the same technologies and or methods are covered in the more strenuous program. So this is specific to these programs. So if you look at the PL1, you'll see the term uh, discipline. Uh, you'll also see subdiscipline. So what are we referring to uh, as a discipline? So calibration and testing, that's the Large majority of our labs are 17025, either calibration or testing organization. Um, it's a category of calibrations or a set of tests intended to quantify or evaluate common or related parameters of a unit, device, or substance submitted for a calibration or test. So here we've listed the <clears throat> PJLAs and um, uh, disciplines. Uh, we currently accredit organizations in the following. Calibration, acoustic, chemical, dimensional, electrical, mass, force, and weigh-in devices. Uh, mechanical, optical, thermodynamic, and time and frequency. Testing, we've uh, got the following disciplines. Uh, acoustical, biological, chemical, Dimensional inspection, electrical, environmental, optical, mechanical, microbiological, non-destructive, and thermodynamic testing. You also see the term subdiscipline um, within PL1. So basically, a subdiscipline uh, is at a minimum a subdiscipline is an element of an associated calibration or test discipline for which the magnitude of the stated parameter has been defined as a measured objective and will be determined by a specified method using appropriate skills and equipment. So a more simplified way of stating this would be uh, if you can do one, you can do the other. So we're going to get into some examples here. So you can combine some uh, disciplines, subdisciplines, into co combined on um, subdisciplines. Um, we'll touch on that. <clears throat> so pretty much as I just stated, a subdiscipline may be composed of one or more elements where the organization has determined that the measured objective, the spe specified method, and the appropriate equipment are either identical or similar to such a degree that they can be considered mutual representative. In addition, the organization shall have determined that the successful uh, performance of either would be satisfactory objective evidence of the technical competency necessary to successfully perform the others. So a record, actually, and this is right in the PL1, um, when you combine subdisciplines, a record is required for an organization for their reasoning for a subdiscipline group. So again, you have to, if you, if you come to the conclusion, hey, if we can do under this discipline, these various tests, we can sort of clump them into, clump them into uh, combined subdisciplines. Um, you have to have a, a record stating what came to um, what uh, um, what was your determining factor. Ideally, yes, like I stated before, um, you can the procedures the same. Perhaps the uh, ideally the equipment, the standards, the protocol might just be something as simple as just the uh, device indicates in a different way. 
So I'm putting together a four-year plan. And sure, the plan addresses all the disciplines, those major disciplines that we went over um, there for, uh, we went over in testing and calibration, at least once during the time interval by the four-year plan. Where a discipline is composed of several sub-disciplines, the sub-disciplines uh, chosen shall, shall as a requirement, be from among the more challenging and comprehensive within the specified discipline. Each successive subdiscipline chosen in subsequent proficiency tests shall be from the more challenging of the subdisciplines remaining. So um, a lot of a lot of verbiage there, but we're going to um, sort of dissect it a little bit here. <clears throat> so this process uh, shall continue for your plan. Like I said, it's not a one-time thing. The process shall continue um, until all disciplines and subdisciplines have been included at least once. Within the period of time when any four-year plan is active, not all subdisciplines may be selected for proficiency test. However, all disciplines um, shall be represented at least once during each successful proficient four-year period. So those major categories, uh, calibrations such as um, electrical, uh, mechanical, um, mass, uh, force, weighing devices, those separate uh, disciplines, uh, that's their, your scope of accreditation, that's how they're set up on their disciplines, and then all the sub-disciplines are listed under there. Um, each one of those disciplines, uh, if you have uh, two of them, uh, they have to each be covered over the four-year plan. If you have seven or eight, yep, you're going to have to um, incorporate it where you get them all done within a four-year period. So uh, talking, about, we were referring to uh, um, combining some disciplines into subdisciplines. So I have a couple examples here. I uh, have one for calibration, one for testing. So again, th these are where you determine, hey, uh, the standard, uh, the procedure, protocol for testing one is is similar, if not identical, to the to the other. So if you perhaps have micrometer uh, dial indicator and caliper on your scopes, and a lot of our folks do, um, the reasoning behind um, combining these all into a combined sub-discipline would be for the dimensional discipline, the organization has determined it to measure objectives, a specified method and appropriate skills and equipment used to calibrate micrometers and to calibrate calipers, also dial indicators are either identical or similar to such a degree that uh, they can be considered as mutually representative. So if you are shown through a proficiency test uh, on a caliper, that can be crosswalked over and ideally favorable proficiency testing. Hey, if you can do the caliper, yes, you can do the uh, dial indicator and the micrometer as well. Um, I know there's many tests and many calibrations over there out there. Um, these are just a couple examples. Um, so we're going to look at the, oh, uh, threaded fastener. Uh, you may have both a uh, new harness and Vicker harness under your um, mechanical discipline, Rockwell harness. Um, for mechanical dis discipline, uh, the organizations has determined, where you've determined you can, can combine these, um, that the measured objectives, the specified method, and appropriate skills and equipment used in a test harness by either one of these, you know, or and, and Vickers, or either identical or similar to, to agree that they can be considered as mutually representative. representative. Uh, something that just crossed my mind, um, um, I apologize, I should have said this during the opening, um, and uh, we we're talking about recording the webinars. There is a place on your screen where you can type in questions. Please keep all the questions related to today's topic. At the end of the uh, 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 presentation, I can go back and look at those questions, review them, and, and, and answer them. Um, I apologize, I, I should have mentioned that earlier. Better late than never, right?
So again, at a minimum, organizations are required to have objective evidence of favorable proficiency testing for each test discipline in their scope within a four-year period. So we're really emphasizing that. That should be the first thing when you put together your four-year plan, making sure you get all those uh, disciplines covered. So I'm going to go through another example here. Uh, if you're accredited for only four disciplines and two have no subdisciplines, while the other two disciplines have multiple subdisciplines, all four disciplines must be represented in the four-year plan at least once during the four-year period in which the plan is active. Two, two disciplines that have no subdisciplines is chosen from and will be present on the plan in the years chosen by the organization. The other two disciplines will be represented by selections of their subdisciplines. The subdisciplines chosen, again, should be from more of those challenging uh, of those available. During the next four years, those disciplines represented by selected subdisciplines will be reported by different subdisciplines selected again from the more challenging of those remaining. So in other words, if you have uh, several sub-disciplines under a uh, um, major discipline, uh, you go through the four year, you, you select from the most challenging ones there, include that in your four year, then you roll around to the next four year. You don't wanna do the same sub-discipline. You're gonna go down and choose from uh, your other list of sub-discipline. And again, you can, uh, this is bare bones minimum. You can always do more, can never do less than uh, what we're stated here in PL1. So um, I also mentioned that our that the requirements in 17025 uh, are incorporated into uh, PL1. Section 7.7.1, .7 if you think about it, the laboratory shall have a procedure for monitoring the validity of results. The resulting data shall be recorded in such a way that trends are detectable. And where, at, where practical statistical techniques shall be applied to review the results. This monitor shall be planned and reviewed and shall include where appropriate but not limited to. The reason I put this slide in here, and I'm thinking of some of these great big labs with, uh, oh, um, uh, a lot of subdisciplines. So if you think about that, the way that four year plan, you're choosing from the more challenging, it might be quite some time if you're doing bare bones minimal. Um, before you get to some of these sub-disciplines. However, you should, as required by 771, for everything under your scope of accreditation, have some sort of, uh, um, uh, you all have, you're required to have a procedure in, in place for monitoring the validity of results. So it's not just something that, just because you haven't covered this, perhaps it's a test or calibration that you rarely have, you may have a single customer perhaps, it, uh, prompts you to keep it on your scope of accreditation, you still have to uh, um, assure that uh, they are um, being uh, um, under control and the validity of those uh, um, results are also being monitored as per what well, can ever come under 771. And there's a laundry list of things there, A through K, intra-lab testing, repeatability checks, check standards, um, reference materials, uh, checking of results or some of the things under there. So if you're a, a lab and we get these quite often as assessors, uh, we uh, we go to, into a uh, assessment and an organization wants to expand their scope. They want to add to the testing or calibrations. So that's something you need to consider uh, when you expand your scope. It, um, your uh, uh, scope expansion items, it's gonna have to be supported by proficiency testing. So I mentioned here, if you are expanding your scope, your assessor is gonna look for compliance to 7.2.1.5 that, uh, hey, you have to verify that you cannot properly perform this method. Um, you have to have some sort of um, proof um, that you can do it. And that's a method verification. Um, so, and you have to have records of the verification and they have to be retained. Um, if for whatever reason the method is revised, um, then you have to re-verify that you can do it. Um, and uh, the reason I mention that here is um, proficiency tests can be a means of meeting this requirement. 
it's a way could, could could be utilized as a means to actually verify a method. If you want to expand your scope, you're going to have to incorporate it anywhere in the four-year plan. You're going to have to verify the method, uh, not 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 specifically requiring it, uh, just stating when you expand your scope. Yes, you need to consider that uh, um, you have to include it in proficiency tests, but you also need to verify that you can properly uh, perform the test and procedure. So there's various uh, avenues as far as approved means of proficiency testing. So uh, that, well, actually we got them listed here as far as the pecking order, uh, the top being the, the most uh, appealing to PJLA if an organization was to follow it. So we have uh, participation, um, through a third party provider who is 17043 accredited. So there's organizations that are actually in the business of doing proficiency testing. And actually there is a, a international standard 17043, uh, which an organization can get accredited under. And actually it's one of our newer ones at PJLA. We do offer that accreditation to proficiency testing provider. Uh, next on the list is a uh, third party by a provider who is not accredited. Um, then interlab comparison organized by industry groups through such things as round robins, method validation studies, small groups, small groups, including two party comparisons. So this is uh, may not be uh, coordinated through a third party provider. Bare bones minimum. This would be uh, two organizations uh comparing their results on the same artifact or same sample and then analyzing them in a meaningful way so this is something the organizations are doing on their own there's also industry groups that you may be uh, um, associated with that will conduct these interlab comparisons So we do I want to mention two others here. Uh, when the use of third party or interlab is considered by the organization as being impractical means of demonstrating proficiency. So following activities listed in their order of preference may be used pending prior approval by PJLA. And this is intralab comparisons and repeatability studies. With both of these, you're just keeping your results within your organization. You're not com comparing them from outside. And uh, this is something that if for whatever reason, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more detail here, um, if you felt you need to proceed with an intralab test, um, the onus is going to come on to the organization as a requirement to Put in writing, state why third party or interlab comparisons are not feasible. Why? You know, if you want to do a, if you want to, for example, um, put a, uh, um, say a caliper micrometer for calibration, and it, um, that's going to be an area where there are plenty of third party providers out there. But that's an area that we're not going to, to approve uh, intralab testing. Um, so you have to state your case. Uh, you have to state why um, interlab or third party are not feasible, and then how you plan to conduct the uh, the intralab test and analyze the data in a meaningful way. And that's got to be submitted to PJLA headquarters for review, and that will come to the program manager. I actually get them all for calibration um, as far as approving these two types of proficiency testing intralab and repeatability studies. So bear in mind, if an organization provides a four-year uh, plan with intralab repeatability studies without prior authorization, and we added this directly into our uh, policy that, hey, that would be considered a non-conformance. So just don't put it on your plan. You know, if, and even if it's a even if it's uh, you have good reasoning and justification for doing so, make sure you get that uh, written approval, uh, uh, um, get the record that that has been approved by PJLA headquarters. So again, we do maintain a list of all organizations that's been approved for intralab and repeatability studies. Uh, and this is subject to reapproval with each four year plan. So, Again, you should maintain a copy of your record of this approval 
And uh, once uh, four year is over and you still have the need, perhaps something's changed. Perhaps there is now a third party or interlab uh, um, opportunity. Um, then uh, you would be expected to follow suit. If not, that uh, approval process may have to be repeated. All right, so let's be stated the uh, third party proficiency testing provider. Uh, they're at the top of the peck in order. Um, so they're independent third party. Additionally, a proficiency test includes the participation of a reference laboratory and use their results to determine performance. So PGLA promotes uh, third-party proficiency testing and strongly encourages accredited or application applicant organizations to, to participate in proficiency testing sponsored by a third-party provider. When such a program exists. And uh, some of the reasoning and advantages behind um, utilizing a uh, third-party provider is um, it assures that the proficiency testing takes place at appropriate and regular intervals. There's complete objectivity on the part of the proficiency testing provider. Um, even um, if the, those of you that have participated in a third party proficiency test, your results are um, known only to you. You would get a report, um, you would be assigned perhaps a code, a number, a letter, Everybody else will be, and you can actually see how you compare to other organizations, but nobody knows whose uh, results are um, whose. And then, of course, the uh, proficiency testing provider, they're, they're a completely independent organization who um, has a complete objectivity as far as the results of those proficiency tests. Um, also, the third party provider will provide statistical analysis and reporting of the resultant data by the provider. And now actually, if you like, report um, report uh, those directly to PJLA at uh, your request. We do require, uh, typically those are accredited. One of the things that we do require before going on site is, hey, what proficiency testing have you done since uh, the uh, last time we performed an assessment? So we do have um, on our website, uh, we do have a proficiency testing uh, tab and we do list some third party providers. So uh, when you choose a third party provider, uh, um, the organization should confirm that the proficiency testing provider is competent. Um, Probably the highest level of competence that can be demonstrated through a proficiency testing provider would be through 17043 accreditation. However, there's other bases for determining competency, such as well recognized national or international programs, organizations mandated by regulatory authorities. Um, if the organization has questions or concerns regarding potential third party proficiency testing provider, you can contact our headquarters. We actually we have on our website, we list third party providers. I couldn't remember if I had that covered or not. That's the last uh, tab for third party providers. Um, on our website is a listing of uh, third party providers that we already have approved, we already have looked at. We have we already have determined, hey, they are competent and our organizations uh, can, can utilize these avenues, third party avenues listed on our website uh, as a third party to perform their third party proficiency testing. All right, an interlab comparison. So bare bones minimum, this is your organization, one other organization comparing the uh, um, um, testing or calibrating the same artifact. And then you're gonna compare the data. And I say bare bones minimum, uh, and I, I see it for smaller organizations, hey, it's great if you're able to coordinate these with another organization, um, but that for whatever reason, if they're not comparing with each other, if there's only two of them, uh, and I've seen this before, you know, your lab might be fine, it might be on the other side. Um, the other side could be saying the same sort of thing. Um, so uh, 
it's, it's fine if you agree with each other, but if you don't agree, it's really, uh, um, well, you know, is it us or them? But bare bones minimum, it's uh, two organizations uh, performing testing or calibration on the same or similar article, artifact, or sample using compatible methods under specified condition. The resulting data of each organization should be in agreement with that of other participants. Organizations should be, uh, whenever practical, um, uh, that I think I'm supposed to be a, um, yeah, there's a mistype type of the typo there, should be accredited. However, uh, missing the word accredited there. Sorry about that. However, in cases where the participating laboratories are not accredited, it is up to the laboratories to confirm their competencies. Records of this competencies shall be maintained. So that's a change there. Uh, if uh, if you recall, during the um, uh, before we revised it, we used to um, state you had to be accredited or you had to utilize the LF-123, which uh, was a form which, hey, that's a fine way for calibration labs to go, but not so much for testing. Um, LF-123 is for non-accredited sources for measurement traceability. So I don't want to go into that uh, in uh, in detail as to exactly what it is because we've removed that. So if you are doing an inner lab comparison, say bare bones minimum, it's yourself, the other organization, um, and the other organization is not accredited, it's going to be up to you to determine, hey, what's uh, what's um, what what am I using to base this other inner lab partner that they are competent could be a manufacturer they could be uh uh within uh, um uh perhaps um oh uh industry groups uh performing um uh inner lab comparisons uh, such as uh i know with the state program nist office of weights and measures does it um ncsli um as far as uh um calibration labs, coordinating interlabs uh, comparisons. However, uh, for smaller organizations, if you're most of the time when I see an interlab comparison is, is us and another lab, bare bones minimum, the more the merrier. If the other lab is not uh, accredited, then you're going to have to, I'm sure, to put the proof in the pudding. If they are a calibration lab, the LF-123, by all means, is, is another way to show competencies if they're not accredited. If they are accredited, then i.e. that scope of accreditation will fit, would uh, um, fulfill uh, the competency requirement. I put this in here, uh, 773, uh, it's required. So, uh, and um, written non-conformances on this in more than one case. Let's say bare bones minimum, you're doing a uh, yourself and another organization for an interlab test. Um, you, you either compare or you don't compare. You have to analyze the data. So you have to have some sort of vehicle for, for determining whether or not the uh, um, the results are in agreement. And we need to see a record of that analysis. And as, as per, you can see what the requirement is from 773. What I've, I've seen, okay, here's ours, our results, and here's their results. Okay, well, okay, I see the results. Did they pass? Did they fail? Are they in agreement? And what are you basing that on? So uh, a couple of uh, ways to analyze proficiency testing. Um, and I put this one up here. This is the most popular. It's an e-normal analysis. And actually, uh, we have this calculator on our website. So this is basically, and you can read, this comes right out of uh, um, PL1. Um, this is basically, you're looking at, uh, an, I said bare bones minimum, um, if it's two organizations, it would be both of your results, both of your uncertainties, and they just basically looking to see if they're overlapping each other. And that calculation should fall within the absolute value of one. Our calculator um, is um, 
if they pass, it's green. If they uh, don't pass, if they exceed that absolute value of one, they turn red. So again, for interlab comparison, this would be an acceptable means to show, okay, here's our data, here's their data, and these are the e-normal analysis that we've uh, we've completed. I want to mention z-scores, uh, um, which is a correlation of analysis of repeat measurements or other graphical technique that can compare a laboratory's relative performance in a relationship to others in the study in terms of measured value and variation or uncertainty. Uh, I've got a reference here, ISO 13528 that we list in uh, PL1 for further guidance for analyzing proficiency testing. And that's basically uh, the Z-score, that's the formula there, that's uh, how that's calculated out. And uh, intralab comparison. So uh, again, this is something that needs uh, uh, approval uh, from PJLA um, headquarters on. And uh, this would be an example of the, it does it's just within the walls of your organization. So <clears throat> excuse me. Um, this would be uh, if you have say a lead technician, uh, have them test or calibrate an artifact test a sample, and then you have the other uh, um, folks uh, test behind them, and then you can compare the data in a meaningful way. So uh, again, uh, the data needs to be analyzed. You have to have some sort of criteria in place, just as interlab, just like interlab comparison, that uh, what you're basing that on. And again, you have to put in writing, you know, why third party or interlab is not feasible and then um, how you plan to conduct the uh, intra-lab testing. So I think our policy actually when 17025 was revised, you can see what's, re what's required there in 772. And it's basically stating, and there's a shall there, you shall monitor your performance by comparisons with results of other laboratories. And we have this where available and appropriate. So if it's not, that's where we have you state your case, tell us why. Uh, this monitoring shall be planned and reviewed and shall include, but not limited to either of the both. And under that would be the third party proficiency testing or uh, interlab comparison. So even with the organization, uh, basically, that's just basically what we stated there is within the four walls of your um, organization. And sort of like with the interlab, it's just not this is our data, this is their data, even if you have been approved for intra-lab testing, hey, you have to analyze the data. Um, if you do, was that to establish a reference data uh, and have the others uh, folks uh, results be compared, you have to analyze it. Again, that could be a Z-score, could be any normal analysis, uh, um, but you have some sort of basis for determining whether or not the uh, um, the results are in agreement. You should have established predefined limits of acceptance for the even the intra lab proficiency testing. All right, now we're getting to the bottom of the pecking order uh, repeatability studies. Uh, and it's stated there uh, in the case of a specialized organization employing a single technician, proficiency testing may be, de be demonstrated through repeated study. Re with repeatability study. Again, PJLE's uh, headquarters approval is need needed. So what are we talking about here? Repeatability studies consist of a number of tests or measurements, at least eight, performed on the same or similar artifact using the same method under specified controlled conditions. The results of these studies shall be analyzed for statistical validity by appropriate means. So basically stating there that you can repeat the, the results of the test or the uh, calibration. What it, <laughs> what it doesn't do though here, uh, you can repeat it, but are you repeating this, the, the correct value? Just showing whatever you're, you're obtaining that you're able to repeat that. And you can understand why that's at the bottom of the pecking order here as far as preferred methods of proficiency testing. 
All right, I want to mention here international schemes of proficiency testing. And uh, us at PJLA, we're evaluated by ILAC. Uh, through the ILAC, uh, um, we're on the APAC, Asian Pacific region. So you see both of these uh, uh, organizations uh, referenced here. So we're assessed too. And believe it or not, we're actually going through this as I speak. We're having our assessment through ILAC. And one of the things they look at is this, uh, are we participating in uh, this international scheme of proficiency testing? So what are we referring to here? Uh, we're required to participate, us as an accreditation body, uh, proficiency testing sponsored by recognized bodies, including um, APAC, which is the region of ILAC that PJLA falls under here in the United States. And uh, if we are PJA, if uh, let's say, for example, um, uh, it was a lead testing PT that, that came out, we'll, we'll look at the testing and see uh, select from potential participants. Or if there was an electrical calibration type of proficiency testing uh, um, being sponsored through ILAC. So it's not only going to be compared to uh, uh, PJLA accredited labs, but it's going to be compared also with other accredited organizations from other accrediting bodies around the world. So we also like potential participants from our listing of accredited or applicant organization and select nominees for those who qualify on the basis of CMCs or detecting limits um, appropriate for the calibration or test. There will be no cost to the organization except for the time to perform the test. Uh, organizations will be selected first on a voluntary basis. Um, however, uh, and we do send out notifications to the labs, we do uh, determine that uh, qualify. However, we do have the right uh, to require participation by any organization. Oh, wrong way. All right, um, we have us. Uh, we've added some things here for specific uh, um, programs that we have. Um, just basically going to hit the highlights here. Uh, not going to go into these in a whole lot of detail. So the first one is for the uh, the DoD lab program that we already looked at. Um, if you want more detail. Uh, go to uh, th th these requirements are specified in section seven of PL1. So uh, some of the highlights for proficiency testing for these organizations is that shall meet all the requirements for proficiency testing specified in the QSM of these organizations. Um, organizations shall supply PJLA prior to accreditations proficiency testing result for at least 18 months of data. No data older than 18 months uh, with the last data no older than six months. Organizations that fail to meet the requirements throughout the accreditation cycle um, will result in the scope of accreditation being modified. Again, uh, go to section seven PL1 for more detail on if you are involved in this program, medical labs, an area that we uh, we recently added, um, what, ISO 15189. So uh, some of the highlights uh, on here, and uh, that's NXA actually in uh, PL1, specific requirements concerning medical. Um, that the, the lab shall designate appropriate authorities for ensure, ensuring that the laboratory carries out all aspects of proficiency testing. PTs for all subdisciplines shall be conducted twice per year, not to exceed a six month interval. Prior to accreditation, all subdisciplines shall undergo a proficiency testing. Subdiscipline, uh, um, there's a subdiscipline table given as an example in uh, um, Annex A. And it requires the use of accredited 17043 third-party providers when available. All right, uh, so uh, if folks that are accredited under this standard for medical, it looks like your requirements are 
much more stringent than uh, um, what we have for regular 17025 and uh, PL1. All right, uh, thank you. Um, that will conclude today's um, presentation. Uh, let me let's get to the questions here. And bear in mind, and some of these I'm not going to even attempt um, for these very specialized testing. I know, you, of course, you're interested in your program and your um, uh, your area of concern. I'm a calibration person. Uh, so this first person is referring to ICO OES proficiency testing, which is a testing lab. And I'd be quite honest, I have no idea what that is. So. Um, you're asking, uh, is proficiency testing required for every mineral? My stock answer, well, if it's under your accreditation, then uh, yeah, it is required somewhere along the four-year plan. Um, now, we talked about uh, disciplines and sub-disciplines. So if you determine, hey, if we can test one, the standard or protocol for doing it and everything is, is uh, the same, as testing this other one, then you could combine them. So uh, maybe yes and maybe no is my answer to that. If you're able to combine them into combined subdisciplines, then no. All right. Um, if an organization such as fertile, and I'm reading this, this is their type. Oh, an ind I'm sorry, not organ an industry such as fertilizer recognizes their group as an industry standard, even though they are not 17025 accredited. Um, would that be acceptable? Again, um, that would be, but you have to uh, create a record of what's what's making you follow the protocol that, um, yes, um, hey, this is competent. These organizations are competent to, to can perform uh, this proficiency test. Um, I would say based on what you're telling me here, it's, you know, if it's a uh, industry group involved in this specific, specific fertilizer industry, then yeah, I would think chances are, yes, that would be acceptable. And can the four year plan be updated yearly? There's nothing that says it can't be. So uh, I do occasionally, uh, during my assessments, I see where they like to keep keep them running from year to year. So they finish, say, uh, 2021, and then they uh, tag on to the last year, uh, um, the next year um, after coming up in the four-year plan. So it's constantly showing four years. So whatever works for you, um, yeah, if you want to update it, uh, um, annually, your four-year plan, um, then by all means, you can do that. If you want to just have the four-year plan and nothing's changing in your organizations, just bear in mind you have to update them before they they expire. Bear with me a minute, my computer's running a little slow scrolling here. Again, my, my answer to this one is not all inclusive. What would qualify as competencies if not accredited? Uh, when will DND, DOT, et cetera, request? The P I'm not gonna answer, I'm not familiar with that program at all request the PT providers to consider the preparation of extracted methods. If you want to, you can call our headquarters directly. That would go before the program manager there if you really uh, um, need some more information on that. But the question was, what would you determine competencies? I would say uh, various, if, if you're all part of the same industry group, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I mentioned NCSLI perhaps, or uh, 
weights and measures, perhaps you're th through groups that are coordinated through ASTM. Um, um, however, it puts the onus on the organization uh, as far as uh, what are you determining uh, to these other organizations to be competent, but you're referring to third party providers. So, and what we state in PL, um, PL, uh, excuse me, PL1 is uh, we do have a listing of approved providers. And if you have a question about a certain provider to call our office, and if there's a particular um, third party provider and they're not accredited through 17010, and that's second on the pecking list, um, accredited third party providers, and then those that are non accredited, uh, um, determine, determine yourself what, what's, uh, what are you including? What type of analysis would be something I would ask? Are they doing proper analysis of the uh, proficiency testing results? Are they doing E normal Z test or, or do they, are they, uh, how are they analyzing the proficiency testing results? And what are you being compared against? Um, would be some of the uh, questions I would ask if I was going through a provider who is not accredited. How long have they been in business? What, uh, things like that, that uh, may be uh, um, things that uh, can be incorporated in the competencies of a third party provider that's not accredited. Uh, this is an EPA organization, and I have no idea. Again, call our office. Uh, um, they'll put you in, in contact with the person that oversees this program. For the EPA, and I'll, I'll read the question. If anybody else there can can help me out here, please type it in the the box there. Um, EPA one six six four eight two ten versus EPA one six six four B have same NELAC code. PT provider 17043 has assigned two different codes. Now the lab assures that they get accredited. Is there a proficiency testing scheme requirement? The only thing I can refer you on this case is, uh, is our PL1, that section that we cover this program uh, with, you know, as far as us for additional questions concerning the program contact the office and uh, that will go to that program manager to um, perhaps give you a better better answer than I'm giving you right here. Yeah, it's, a lot of questions seems to be, you know, how we, uh, our revision of, I guess, for an interlab lab, you know, to, it, you have to determine the competencies of its, uh, of, uh, of the other organization. And just, just if they are not accredited, and I mentioned before that we were basing that into, uh, um, um, before or through our LF-123. So we give, we give, we're giving you quite a bit of flexibility there right now. Um, as we're putting the onus on the lab, if the other organization is not competent, um, what are you basing that on? Why, why do you want to participate with them on a proficiency testing? Um, And you know anything? You know things that just come. I'm fresh with this. To me, I'm a calibrator. If I was a calibration non-accredited provider. I'm sure that the other non-accredited organization, if I'm doing an interlap test with them, is of course if their measurements are traceable. Hey, let me look at the stand. What standards are you using, and who calibrated them? What is your uncertainty? Let me. You know their uncertainty budgets, that sort of thing that uh, you would need to know that they had in order. You want to be, uh, um, you know, short of that sort of thing. Uh, with testing, um, could still be the same same sort of thing. 
or how, how long have they been in, this, in business? Uh, um, how uh, any testimonials perhaps from uh, customers of theirs could be uh, um, considered as uh, records for determining competency requirements. Next one here, and this is out of my realm too, but I can I think I could tell you how, where to go here for biocompatible testing that uses analyzm. It is hard to perform PT and still be in line with animal welfare concerns. Can positive control studies that are done concurrently with regular testing be used as a PT? I would say, uh, well, you'll probably have to jump through that hoop as far as doing, uh, if that's just within the confines of your four walls, where yes, you, you can request that, you can put it in writing, uh, you know, why you have to pursue this uh, type of uh, proficiency testing that third party or inner lab is not feasible. Um, like apparently, yeah, with uh, this type of testing, there is um, animal welfare concerns, of course. You know, state that in your request for writing. Then you have to have a good means of uh, actually performing the proficiency test. And it will go to the program manager. And uh, we have a lot of assessors, technical experts at PJLA, that uh, if we're not real sure, we can sure find someone to review it and concur with you. Hey, you know, this is the only way that this proficiency testing can be done. Um, calibration, you know, I can, some things that uh, gets, gets approved for intra-lab testing, uh, I'll give you a couple that I come across are for like truck scales. Uh, there is no third-party provider, and that's something that's hard to conduct an inter-lab test. Um, those of you that are doing uniformity studies of big chambers, ovens, furnaces, um, there is no third-party program there. That's another thing that's hard to coordinate in intra-lab testing um, for. And it's about, um, we'll analyze on a scope of accreditation need PT. Um, if I have 50 analytes on the scope of accreditation, but only 25 of these analytes have PTs available, does the other 25 analytes require PT? Um, well, if you're in a nutshell, yes. Um, if it's on your scope of accreditation, it needs to be supported by proficiency testing. If there is no third party provider, then you would pursue uh, what's um, what we've got, we, we've said several times here. You have to state your case, um, put in writing. Uh, you know why third party or an inner lab is not feasible, and how you plan to conduct it. Um, I, I mentioned, you know, I threw out an example. If somebody gave me that request for a um, for a pH meter or a micrometer. I'm not going to approve it because I know there's plenty of. Uh, third party providers out there. So the organization would, and I'm the one that approves them for calibration, would need to uh, either uh, go through the third party or, or or do an interlap because even a standard says you have to compare your results to other results outside um, your uh, organization. So um, again, yes, it's going to have to be considered, but you don't have to go through the third party provider. If you if if what you're stating here is in fact true, if there are no third party providers out there, <coughs> and for whatever reason you can't coordinate an interlab test, and then and and they are valid reasons, chances are it could get uh, approved for an intra lab type of testing. I, I, this next question, you know, I can't, I can't say for sure. I, I, I see them on a lot of third-party providers. How often are Z-test and T-test used in statistical analysis of consistency of results? I'll say most of your accredited 17043 uh, 
providers uh, does utilize the Z-test e-normal analysis, bare bones minimum. Uh, T-test, I really, uh, I don't think personally myself and under calibration, uh, I just see T-test, uh, you know, as far as incorporating it in with uh, um, degrees of freedom, that's about it. Or that's a T-table, I'm sorry. But uh, in, in my realm, I don't see T-test uh, used too often for calibration. I have seen the other, E-normal e seems to be the most popular. Uh, Z-scores are incorporated quite often with uh, third-party providers. All right, uh, that's uh, very good questions. I, I, I didn't mean to be so, uh, not so clear on some of these because I, I wasn't really sure of how that would be handled um, for the particular test that you were mentioning. So before I go, I uh, just want to uh, give you a heads up for next month. Uh, June 28th, uh, it's already on our website. Uh, like I said, uh, all of our, uh, opening up today's meeting, all of our policies have been updated. So uh, we're going to go and throw up PL2 uh, next month, which is our requirements on traceability. So uh, thank you all for uh, joining us today and uh, look forward to um, doing this again and having you with us uh, next month. <laughs>